Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Camilla Benbo, and I am the dean of Vanderbilt University's Peabody College. Peabody is Vanderbilt's College of Education and Human Development and home to the National Center on Performance Incentives. We're very excited to have you here, especially if this is your first chance to visit Nashville. Nashville is really a great place, and even more so when you can be associated with an institution that adds so much to the quality of life in our city and the region. I feel very, very privileged. Peabody's college mission is to create knowledge, to educate leaders, to support practitioners, and engage with and transform communities in the broadest sense of that term. Making the practice of education more effective is the heart and soul of what we do. It is a mission I believe we share with many of you. Research, of course, is critical to our efforts, and the National Center on Performance Incentives, NCPI, is one of our foremost research initiatives. In 2006, NCPI led the design and implementation of the first true experimental study on teacher performance pay ever conducted in the United States, which you will have the opportunity to learn about firsthand tomorrow. So less than 24 hours, I hear. Since 2006, NCPI and its partners have employed experimental designs to assess a team-level performance pay program in Round Rock, Texas, to evaluate a school-wide performance pay program in New York City, and to help lead a national impact evaluation of the Teacher Incentive Fund program in partnership with Mathematica. NCPI's outreach and development efforts have been equally important. NCPI has been remarkably successful at creating a venue for some of the top thought leaders in educational research, policy, and practice to not only engage a set of prominent education reform issues, but also to advance public knowledge and dialogue about them. This conference is one example of such efforts, and I know that your conference organizers have been busy preparing a conference that will be productive, educational, and hopefully inspiring. On behalf of the college, I want to thank them for their hard work. Now, we are especially pleased that Battelle for Kids has joined us to host this year's conference. In just a moment, we will have a chance to hear from Jim Mahoney, who is Battelle for Kids Executive Director. Along with charter schools, performance incentives are at the forefront of the reform debate. Too often, however, that debate is dominated by political ideals. It becomes hard to move beyond the rhetoric to examine and learn from actual scientific evidence. NCPI and Peabody College researchers in general are defined by an empirical orientation. What I mean by that is NCPI and their partners have sought to conduct studies that are scientifically sound and free from partisanship. By gathering to discuss the salient issues, consider research findings, and disseminate what we're learning about evaluating and rewarding educator effectiveness, you are helping to create an environment for informed policy making. Now, I know that you're anxious to hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Jim Mahoney. As I said, Jim is the executive director of Battelle for Kids, a position he has held since 2001. He is also a former superintendent, school principal, teacher, academic, and author. He has shared his expertise as an adjunct faculty member at Ohio State University, Ohio University, Ashland University, Muskingum University. In recognition of his contributions, Jim has been honored by numerous Ohio educational organizations, including both the Ohio School Boards Association and the Ohio Federation of Teachers. Mattel for Kids is a national, nonprofit organization dedicated to the improvement of education. It provides strategy and counsel and assists with the implementation of effective practices in schools. Its emphasis on value-added analyses, student learning assessment, and rewarding teacher effectiveness put Patel for Kids at the forefront organizations working to reform education. I'm pleased to introduce Jim Mahoney. Jim? It's been a terrific morning. I want to start with uh, a quote, an assertion, and a story. Uh, the quote is this. Someone once said, don't ever try to climb over a wall leaning towards you. 
kiss a woman leaning away from you or talk to an audience about a topic they know more about. <laughs> the truth of it is, this morning was a great example in assembling so many of those panelists who have incredible expertise. Uh, join me, would you, for just a minute in applauding all those people who are here this morning. They were terrific. <laughs> they represent a tremendous resource for all of us. My assertion is this. We need to have a compensation system that is worthy of the teaching profession. And this is an absolute difficult challenge, but at the end of the day, we need that. The story is this. Uh, there was uh, a seven-year-old who was taking a drawing class as part of an art program. And she was working on something, the teacher walked by her and said, Sarah, what are you drawing? Sarah said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the art teacher said, well, Sarah, no one knows what God looks like. And Sarah said, well, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> That's what we're all doing. Uh, when <clears throat> Memphis had listed up 1.0, I suspect many of us are a little less than 1.0. But there are going to be iterations of this quick, and we will learn from each other as we go through this. There's no question about this and how important all of this really is. My friend Todd says, is the juice worth the squeeze? That is what everyone is asking, whether you're in a school district, whether you're in a state education association, whether you're the union helping to negotiate the contract, we're all looking at this in some way. Now, what I'm not going to do is give you, you know, like some, if I were to pick up Red Book magazine, you know, five ways to do this, three ways to do this, six ways to do this, and make it simple, because it isn't simple. This is very complex, and we need to be very, very thoughtful as we work through this. There was a story, Carla, in the Houston newspaper about 12 years ago. And somewhere in Texas, a bull had broken through a large plate glass window. Now, it was at a holodome, and it goes crashing through these windows. Now, fortunately, the bull goes in the swimming pool. Now, the quick-thinking manager hit the safety relief valve. All the water drains out of the pool. Now, you just had a bull that was mad, but is in the back of the, the bottom of the pool here. Well, nobody's in danger, and they're all watching this, so they call 911. Fire department shows up. Fire department said, well, we're not sure exactly what to do with this. But there was a rancher who heard it on his scanner. Now, the rancher goes over, and he said, you guys need some help? He said, we do. So he takes a couple of two-by-sixes. He places them down in the pool. He walks down. He puts a halter around the bull, leads the bull up to two-by-sixes, leads the bull out to his pickup truck where he had the tailgate down, two more two-by-sixes, leads the bull up that, slides the boards in. That's the tailgate. said, where do you want me to take them? This is an absolute true story. Now, the moral to the story is not for every complex problem, there's a simple solution. That's not true, but there is a moral. If you have a bull problem, get somebody who knows something about bulls. So having the audience of everyone who has a stake in this to collaborate is absolutely essential if we're going to get to 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and to keep advancing this agenda. It's very clear in the last uh, PDK Gallup poll, if you looked at it, three out of four Americans now agree with the notion of tying in some way aligning teacher pay to student performance. There's greater and greater support. In the last decade, that dial has moved tremendously. Race to the top, clearly. That was a major piece of the winning state's formula. So all of this sets the context for this. And I want to offer not simple ideas, because you really have to go in depth, because these aren't four simple steps. But I want to give you four ideas that we've learned in wrestling with this issue with so many pioneers who are willing to do this, because there's not a prescription to get out there. I want to start first with the A, which is adaptation. And several people mentioned that. <clears throat> uh, if you've read the book by Heifetz and Linsky called Leadership on the Line, one of the concepts they talk about is the importance of adaptive leadership. Adaptive leadership is changing people's hearts and minds about something. So this isn't just a technical challenge. It's not you've got to have the right measures, you get the right measures, you have the empirical evidence. This is about changing hearts and minds, too. This is really important. So there's an adaptive challenge with this. And not only adapting it to your culture, your state, your district, 
but thinking about the hearts and minds of people. Because we're trying to undo a unitary salary system that's gone on for 100 years. And as you begin to align individual goals to organizational goals, people will almost put up with any how if they support the why and the understanding of this. So when you think about the adaptive challenge, it's an absolutely a critical one. I'm going to give you a good example. <clears throat> I know there are several people here from Houston. And if you read the first year that Houston went through the, for their pay for performance system, I'll tell you what, 99.9% .9 of the districts in America would have stopped after the board meeting with 1,000 people. And it was due to the courageous leadership of the superintendent and the board and the support of the central office staff and others that it was, no, we didn't do it the way we wanted to do it. We didn't do it well, but we are going to do it. And they did do that. And this country has benefited by their courage and the steps that they've taken. But they reframed pay for performance and made it part of recognizing excellence. And there were several pieces as part of that. And recognizing excellence was just one of four other pillars, which was to outline Aspire, which was their school transformation model. They gave people something much bigger to buy into than this solitary piece. So adaptation is very, very important. We have a long history of this not working. One of the questions I think you have to ask yourself when you think about this is, what challenge are you trying to solve? So that you don't go in with a solution, what challenge are you trying to solve? There's a big difference between, we don't have enough certified math teachers to teach math. We can't attract science teachers at the high school level. That's a different question than, we want a strategy that will enable us to recruit people. We want a strategy that will help us to retain people. Many rural districts have a strategy to recruit, but then they often lose teachers who then go to suburban districts. So think about the problem that you're trying to solve, the adaptation. So it isn't just one size fits all. We also need to understand what motivates teachers. If someone, and someone said this earlier, if someone said to me as a teacher that, or suggested that I'd been withholding services, waiting for your stipend, I would be offended by that. And I think that is an important distinction to make here. Uh, I don't believe, that's certainly not what the research suggests motivates teachers. Someone asked in one of their questions today about Daniel Pink in his book, Drive, because he suggests intrinsic motivation is very, very powerful, and there are three things that drive that. One is having a sense of purpose. Education, does, it has that built in. Autonomy and mastery. One of the things that we can help teachers to use data is to see that they are as my grandmother would say, doing right by their kids. So you see your kids growing and your impact is there. Those are motivating. Four of the most powerful motivators for teachers are this. Praise. It's really, absolutely recognition of a job well done. It's involvement. It's expectation. So they understand what's expected of them. And it's also standing beside. So when I mention all this adaptation, you have, to, you have to think about all those things. I've met many teachers who the most important thing to them is, who's going to be the principal? Because I'll follow great leadership. What are the learning conditions? What's the climate? What's the culture of that building? So all of those things are absolutely important, and it deserves all of us to be thoughtful about it. So that's the adaptation. The second one are benefits. I think the most important question you have to answer is, if you do all this, who's going to benefit from it, and how will you know? At the heart of that, if student outcomes are not at the center of that, if student engagement is not at the center of that, then I would argue we're just confusing activity for accomplishment. We have found some other piece to play with, but at the end of the day, student benefits. Because oftentimes with change, we get so wrapped up with all of the things that we're doing to move people along, and how come she doesn't buy into that, and what about that team? And at the end of the day, we forget the goal was to help students. Student benefits have to be at the heart of this. It absolutely is critical, and we cannot ever, ever forget that. So when you ask, have I improved teacher effectiveness at the end of the day? It's really important. Now, I realize the next thing I'm going to offer here is a real opinion. 
uh, because there's lots of research that is absent in this vacuum as we begin moving in this. But I think that if we make this simply about money and judgment and not about improvement and learning, we will have missed an opportunity. Uh, so teachers are interested not just in the end here, but what are the things we do day to day, week to week, to support the professional growth of teachers and formative instructional practices? How do you help teachers set learning targets so they can see the growth of their kids in real time so we don't wait till the end of the year? It's not just about at the end of the year. And they can see the connection between what we do day to day, week to week. We get different results here at the end. It is about student benefits because we're preparing our kids for a world that many of us could never, ever imagine. Uh, when I was a kid, the truth is the competition was across the county. Now, I grew up in Ohio. The competition is not across the county. It's not even across the state. You all know where it is. It's across the world now. And when I started teaching, it was all about what did I do? And now the question is not what does the teacher do, but what did the students learn? Now, we understand there ought to be a connection. So we want to make sure that as you do any of this, you make sure that we talk about benefits. Part of the thing I thought, well, why now? One thing NCLB has done, whether you agree or disagree, it has created a wealth of data year to year that enables us to look at some things that we didn't have before. Because sometimes discovery isn't discovering some new place. It's looking at an old place with new eyes. And this has given us a new set of eyes around the efforts that we make at, at the building level, at the teacher level, in which to make those kinds of improvements. So when you think about benefits, student benefits have to be at the front and center of all this whenever you do this. What we cannot do, in my view, is just simply, well, we're going to recognize the best and hope for the rest. We need a strategy around what we're going to do to make this work. Now, if you take the first two here, adaptation and benefits, those really have to do with why you would do it. The last two I want to mention have more to do with the how you do it. The C is communicate. I've said this a gazillion times. People are down on what they're not up on. So the idea of we're going to airlift this in, absolutely, again, I think the people who do it best are those who collaborate, they start small, they think big, and they communicate why it is they're trying to do this. How might we do this? What kinds of information might we gather to help us better to serve children? Make it part of a much larger strategy. The idea of now we're going to get this is the silver bullet we've been missing. Now, I know there are some people who believe that. Well, if you just pay people differently, that'll be the change. People see what they look for oftentimes. The truth of it is, it ought to be a piece of a much larger strategy. If you're spending 70 to 80% of your money on people, then aligning your largest expense in some systematic way to the outcomes of the larger organization, it just makes sense. That's your largest expense. How might we redo this in such a way that aligns individual teacher performance with the goals of the organization, which are learning outcomes. And to do that, we've got to communicate and involve and communicate and communicate and communicate. It's not enough to just, well, we, we put out a memo a couple years ago about that. I think there's something on the website. If you look at real change, one of the key strategies is constantly having that conversation and reminding people. So communication is, has to be at the heart of this strategy of whatever you're doing. Susan Scalfani wrote in the, the Kappen magazine, I really liked it about it, or I liked her article. She talked about in Sweden, they have really changed the compensation model, and it's been uh, something that has, over time, not only increased the salary of Swedish teachers, but improved student outcomes, et cetera. And as I read it, I couldn't help but be impressed by it. But again, I thought, you can't take that and airlift it somewhere either. What we take are all of these ideas and we figure out what's going to be our strategy with people, not to people, helping kids, and then communicate it and make our initial design in a way that absolutely makes sense for all of us. Uh, if we're going to make this thing built to last, this is the way we have to do it. And sometimes to go fast, 
you need to go slow. Now, you're all doing this fast. That's not to just simply, well, we're going to, you know, the ready, aim, aim, aim. The truth of it is, most of here, most of us who are doing some of this have done scant little aiming and are firing, and we're learning. But it's, it's the difference between kids. When I first started teaching, you would teach kids. The idea was, here, I'm going to teach you how to do something, and then we're going to practice it. You would learn to do. That is not what kids do today. They're doing it to learn. And it doesn't matter whether it's texting or whatever, they're immediately into doing it. They're not waiting till they learn it, and then we're going to apply it. And in many respects, that's exactly what we're doing here. It's the opposite of oftentimes what you get in a classroom. In a classroom, it used to be a student would get the lesson and then the test. That's not what's happening for all of us. We have the test, and then we're getting the lessons afterwards. So that's what we're doing, is sharing all these lessons as we move this uh, agenda forward. So communicating is very, very critical. The last one is this, and it's been alluded to so much this morning, is design. How are you going to thoughtfully design this? Now, I have a question. How many of you, if I ask you to write a technical paper on a topic that you really absolutely don't like, but I ask you to write a technical paper on it, and I ask you to do it, and I would pay you $100 to write a 10-page paper on a technical topic that you need to research that you don't like at all. How many would do it for $100? All right, 1000 Okay, we have several hands. How about $10,000? Okay, just so we're clear, money does matter. <laughs> money does matter. So there's no question about that. It's, <clears throat> so that, there's nothing wrong with that either. So when we think about the whole design thing, we want to do it in such a way uh, that the design is collaborative, that we're trying this together, and that we're going to expect there's going to be some uh, failures along the way. That's part of the design when you do something. I can remember as an assistant superintendent many, many years ago, I helped to plan this in-service for 1,000 teachers, and we had never done this before, and brought several school districts together. And it was one of those things, I had convinced our superintendent we need to do this, and he convinced other superintendents, and we did it. And I have to tell you what, it was the worst damn program anybody ever put together. Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. It was so bad, the next day, teachers in our school district had made little badges that said, I stayed, I stayed, <laughs> and I was sick about it. And I go to our superintendent, and I'm apologizing to him, and he was so great. He said, well, if you're going to do it again, what would you do differently? What'd you learn? And then he said something, and at that stage, he could have just squashed the enthusiasm forever of me. He said, look, there are no failures. There are no mistakes. There are simply lessons. And I think that is really important to take that attitude into this whole thing. You're not going to get it perfect because we don't know what perfect is. What we are going to say is we are willing to take great risks to help our kids because we think the potential benefit of this is worth it. So, yes, we do think the juice is worth the squeeze. So it does matter. Now, when you think about all those measures, I, I have to tell you, when you, when you, the most critical design question becomes, well, what kind of measures are we going to use? Now, we've talked a lot about value added, and that's clearly at the heart of it, and there are different ways to do that. Someone mentioned Ron Ferguson's tripod, which I really like. There's another student measure. If you go to Gallup's website, they have in the Gallup student poll, it measures hope, engagement, and well-being. I think that's a powerful measure. There are lots of pieces out there with which you can put this together in the design. What's important to you? What is important that if we had the information from that, it would help us. So when we think about the design, it is absolutely critical. The other part of this design, and I hear this often, well, what are we going to do with the K2 teachers? We're going to do it with the art teachers. We're going to do it with phys ed teachers. I think we make a mistake and we think, well, unless we can, unless we can do it for everybody, then we're just not going to be able to do this. Start with the groups who have the information, who are willing to do this, and to begin to learn and move from that. Don't think we've got to get it right for the whole system, or there's no reason to move on. Uh, if we wait for that, we'll be waiting for a long time. So we need to start somewhere. So the design of this is absolutely important. So as you think about this, uh, 
The last part that I'd mention the design, because too often we've made, whether you call it a pay for performance, and at some point we drop the pay. We need to think about how we're going to sustain this effort because the goal is not to tweak it. It's not to offer one time. It is to forever transform the system of compensation with the organizational goals. So as you think about this, I would argue adaptation is absolutely critical. Benefits have to be at the absolute heart of this. You've got to plan for communications or others will communicate for you. Trust me on that. Uh, and then the last one is design it with some thoughtfulness. And I'll finish with this. There was a nine-year-old boy who really just wanted to play with his dad on a Sunday afternoon, and dad just wanted to take a nap. And it was raining outside, and he realized unless he found something for his son to do, he was never going to get a nap. Well, he looks over in the Sunday accent paper, or the Sunday accent section of the paper, there is a map of the world. It's in color. So he said to his son, he said, hey, let's do this. They go to the kitchen table, and he takes pair of scissors, and he makes a jigsaw puzzle out of the world here with all these colored continents, and he puts it all up, and he said, I'll tell you what, son, you put this back together, and then we'll do whatever you want the rest of the afternoon. You wake me up as soon as that's done. Okay, Dad. So Dad goes to the couch. Ten minutes later, son said, Dad, I've got to put together. Now, he hadn't even fallen asleep yet. So, oh, it's not together. Oh, yeah, it's together. He gets up. He walks over, and sure enough, there's this map this jigsaw puzzle with all these continents that have been put together. How'd you do that? How could you possibly do that? He said, well, it was easy. There was a picture of a man on the other side. And if you get the man right, the world is right. <laughs> it is about our understanding of our needs and interests and preferences that we put these pieces together. But I have to tell you, I have, ne I have never met more people assembled than what we have here today who know how to solve this problem. So I encourage you to enjoy the bull sessions that you go to later. Thank you.